Professor Poor is the Michael Henry Strater University Professor at Princeton University, where his interests include information theory and signal processing and their application in wireless networks, energy systems, and many diverse fields of research, actually. So he has done fundamental contributions to various fields of signal processing, information theory, and optimization, and received many international recognition that I can't really even list them in a few minutes. Uh, he's a member of U.S. National Academy of Engineering and U.S. National Academy of Science and also a foreign member of the Chinese Academy of Science and the Royal Society. Recent recognition of his works include uh, the 2017 IEEE Alexander Graham Bell Medal, 2019 ASEE Benjamin Graver Award, and honorary doctorates from Syracuse University in 2017 and University of Waterloo in 2019. Well, I know him uh, from his papers, of course, uh, from a bachelor's studies working on cognitive radio network like 10 years ago. Uh, so like all of you, I'm super excited to listen to his talk on learning at the wireless age. Good afternoon, everyone, or good morning, I guess, from me, because it's still morning in New Jersey. I hope everyone is doing well uh, in these difficult times. Um, I wish I could be there in person to see you all, but... Uh, this is the way we do things these days. Uh, thank you, Hossein, for the kind introduction, and thank you so much for the invitation. I'm really happy to be part of this exciting workshop. Uh, today, uh, like, just like uh, Denise and Walid, uh, I'm gonna be talking, of course, about uh, learning over wireless. Um, and I think we all discussed this beforehand. We're all gonna be talking about something a little different. Um, I was unable to hear Denise's talk this morning because it was, uh, well, I was asleep, to be honest with you, in that time of day. Uh, but I look forward to seeing uh, the recording of that later. Uh, but I think we all uh, have, uh, have something different to say, so I think hopefully you'll get something out of my talk as well. Uh, you know, uh, machine learning, of course, and wireless uh, networking are two of the most exciting areas of technology development today. Neither one is particularly new. They go back, of course, quite a while, both of them. But right now, there's a lot happening in each field. And in particular, uh, there's, a, there's a, a convergence. That is, uh, there's a lot uh, of machine learning and wireless, and there's a lot that wireless can say about machine learning. So it's a really exciting time. And of course, that's why this uh, workshop has been organized, and I'm, I'm happy to be here. So um, what I'm going to talk about today uh, is, is this. So first of all, uh, I'll just point out, and I think probably Denise also pointed this out, but there's also, you know, it, there's two connections between these two fields, machine learning and wireless communications. Uh, one of them is um, the use of machine learning to optimize communication networks. And of course, that's a very natural connection because wireless communications has so many problems that involve decision making and inference and other kinds of uh, and control, optimization, all those kinds of things that machine learning can help with. Uh, also, there's a lot of data in wireless networks because, of course, uh, bits are created every, uh, I don't know, billions of times a second. So, uh, you know, there's a lot of data out there, and, then, and there's a lot of optimization problems that uh, can be addressed using that data. So data-driven optimization is a very natural thing for communication networks. Uh, the other side of the coin, which I think today's workshop mainly addresses, is the use of mobile networks as platforms for learning, for machine learning. Uh, and that's what I'm going to talk about today, too. I think that's also what you heard from Denise and what you'll hear from Wally a bit later today. Uh, and so that, but that's what I'm going to talk about. The other, the other side of the coin, that is using machine learning to optimize communication networks, um, is also an extremely interesting area. And in fact, we had a, an ICAF tutorial uh, just a couple weeks ago. Um, in fact, maybe it was last week uh, on, on this uh, with Yonina Eldar and um, uh, Nir Schlesinger. Uh, and I think it may still be available online if you're interested in, in seeing that. So anyway, uh, what I'm gonna talk about today is the following. First of all, I'll spend a little bit of time motivating this, uh, some of which I think is completely unnecessary for this audience, but I'll, I'll just to set the stage, I'll, I'll, I'll go over that again anyway. Uh, then I'm going to talk about two kinds of learning at the wireless edge. One is federated learning, which you heard about from Denise this morning, I think a bit. 
and and the other is decentralized learning. And I'll, I'll talk about the distinction between those in a second. And then I'll wrap up with some conclusions. And in the in the conclusions, I'll talk a little bit about some open some open problems that I think are interesting. Because realizing there there are some students and others uh, in this group who might be interested in that. Uh, so let me start out with a little motivation, and, and here's probably a completely unnecessary slide uh, for this group, but just to, again, just to set the stage, let me let me go over this. So this is this is a very um, simplistic overview of the state of the art in machine learning uh, in general. Okay, first of all, you know, again, it's not a new field. I mean, it goes back many many years, but in decades. But right now, there's just uh, been an explosion of interest in machine learning, maybe be may mainly because of two things. One is there's a tremendous amount of data available uh, gathered by smartphones, sensors, gathered on the internet, and so forth. So there's just tremendous amounts of data. And the, there's plenty of computational power to deal with that data. So in both cases, um, there's uh, uh, been a, 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 an enabler of uh, machine learning in so many fields. Uh, now, standard machine learning, which is again a simplistic view, is a cent is centralized machine learning. That is where you you have all the data in one place uh, in a data center or cloud, and you're able to manipulate it uh, as a whole. Uh, and of course, there are many state of the art models for this. Uh, deep neural networks is a very prominent one, and these are run in cloud on big on big computers. Uh, and there's, of course, standard software tools like TensorFlow, where you don't really even have to know that much about machine learning to use them. Um, and there's a specialized hardware for that, like NVIDIA and Google's uh, uh, hardware. So, so this is kind of a very simplistic view of machine learning. Um, but uh, that's not what we're here to talk about today, because, of course, uh, the reason we're all here today is that we know that centralized machine learning uh, might not be suitable for a lot of applications which are which involve wireless okay and so prime example is self driving cars uh, another example is first responder networks where you have uh, an emergency where um, people have to go out and deploy a network very quickly and and so forth or tactical networks where uh, in a military situation where uh, the military has to go out and deploy a network very quickly without the benefit of infrastructure so these applications all have particular uh, peculiarities that, that make them different from the kind of applications you might run on centralized machine learning. For example, first of all, the data is already at the edge of the network. That is, it's, it's created on, on iPhones or IoT devices in such situations. Um, the, the uplinks being wireless typically have limited capacity. Uh, these these applications involve low latency. That is, we need to the decisions or learning and so forth needs to be done quickly, um, and we may not want to uh, induce the latency that we would get from having to go up all the way to a backhaul, all the way to some centralized server, and then download a model from there. Uh, and then also, privacy is an issue in a lot of these applications. In fact, all the ones I mentioned, privacy is important. Um, and, you know, by keeping the data at the edge, we can maintain better privacy, although there's still there's some still some issues of privacy leakage even even there. Uh, and then also there's the issue of locality and scalability. Uh, if we do things at the edge, it's much more scalable. And if we only need to know what's happening at the edge in terms of our models that we're building, uh, it's really not necessary to think about backhauling data all the way to some distant point. So, so all these things uh, motivate moving learning closer to the network edge. Uh, and again, I know this is what we're really talking about today, but I, I just wanted to be sure to put that, in, put that out there as a, a motivator just to remind everyone. So there, there are three uh, machine learning models then that we can talk about. One is the standard machine learning model that I just described where uh, data is collected at the edge. Uh, it's uploaded to the cloud. Machine learning is applied there with all the data, and then models can be downloaded to the edge as needed. Uh, another model is federated machine learning, which you heard about earlier today, uh, where the data is collected at the edge and stays at the edge, and the, uh, it's, it's the end, user, end user devices um, 
such as cell phones or sensors, uh, use their own data to, to create a shared model or to try to learn a shared model. And then their instantiations of that model are uploaded to an edge device like an access point or a, um, uh, a base station where the models are aggregated and then sent back down to the end user devices for further updating and so forth. So that process happens iteratively until some kind of convergence. And then finally, decentralized machine learning is performed also on end user devices. They collect their own data, they do their own learning, but instead of communicating with an edge device, which the edge device would normally serve like uh, the role of like a, a, a cloud, if you would, uh, they just communicate peer to peer with each other. So there's not any aggregator that looks at all the models formed by all the um, end user devices. So this is the decentralized model. And I'm gonna talk about some aspects of each of these models. And of course you've heard others from Denise and you're gonna hear others from Waleed a bit later today. Uh, so let's get started. I'll start with federated machine learning. Uh, and remember federated learning uh, is the model shown here data is collected by end user devices. Uh, they, they're trying to learn a shared model individually. Uh, they upload those models, uh, their own instantiations of those models to an edge device, which serves as an aggregator. That aggregator sends those um, models back to the end user devices where they're updated and, and the process iterates, okay? So the whole idea is to enable end user devices to do machine learning without centralizing the data. So the key features here are that the end users, uh, which we'll call UEs here, keep the raw data locally. Um, training is own devices. That is all the training is done on the end user devices. There's a shared model, so they're all trying to learn the same model. Uh, federated computation, that is an edge node, which we're gonna call an access point, uh, collects the weights weights trained from end, end users uh, and updates the model. Uh, and then that's downloaded back to the end users uh, with, where um, uh, the process is iterated. And sometimes the what I, I say collecting trained weights here, of course there is a model of federated learning, one that Denise talked about where you send the gradients instead of the weights. But here I'll just think about sending the weights. And then another thing that you get here is privacy by default because the data doesn't never leaves the end user devices. Uh, but I put it in quotes for reasons I'll, I'll talk about a bit later. Okay, so here's the issue uh, that I'm gonna talk about today, the ones I'm gonna address now. And that is that communication to the access point needs to go through wireless channels. So federated learning of course can be done without uh, being on a wireless uh, platform. But here I'm interested in the interactions between federated learning and, and, and the wireless channel. So because of that, uh, there are two things we have to worry about. First of all, the, the medium is shared and resource constrained. So the second issue, that is the resource constraint, means that at any given update time, only a limited number of devices can be selected by the edge device to upload their, their models. Okay, so that's just because we have a, just a finite amount of bandwidth, and typically we'd have many, many devices and, and fewer um, channels for uploading data on each round. So, so scheduling is an issue. Uh, and also, because it's a wire, these are wireless links, uh, transmissions aren't reliable due to interference. So we have a lot of devices out there, we have multiple access points uh, and so forth, so there's gonna be interference. So two, two main questions that come up here are the following. First of all, how should we schedule the devices to update the trained weights? So that's to address the resource constraint. And then how does interference affect the training? That's to um, uh, address the fact that we have a shared medium. Okay, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna address those now. Okay, so first of all, let's look at some, some standard scheduling mechanisms and see how they perform in this uh, context. And the work I'm gonna talk about now was published in the Transactions on Communications. Uh, I believe it was the January issue this year. Uh, and you see the, uh, the citation at the bottom of the screen there. So the three, the three scheduling, scheduling mechanisms I wanna talk about here are, first of all, random scheduling, uh, where the access point just uniformly selects 
n out of k uh, end user devices at random. So k is going to be the total number of end user devices uh, that each access point uh, serves. Uh, and, they're, and n is going to be the number of channels that uh, the access point can use to serve them. And so n is um, less than k, of course, otherwise there's, there's no problem here. Uh, so that's random scheduling. We just choose n out of k at random. Round robin, uh, we divide the uh, end user devices up into groups. Uh, and then we just, the access point on successive iterations just chooses the groups and uh, queries the groups, if you will, in uh, sequentially selecting each group uh, in time. And then proportional fare, uh, where the access point selects the um, end user devices at a given time that have the strongest signal to noise ratios at that time. Okay, so random, round robin, and proportional fare. And these are all standard scheduling mechanisms, so they're not ones that we particularly, particularly developed for this process, but we can see how they perform in federated learning. So now, of course, uh, there are going to be two ways in which uh, a, 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 an end user device can fail to upload its model to the access point. One is that uh, in order to be uh, successfully updated, or to successfully participate in the update, um, an end user device has to be selected, first of all. So it has to be one of the devices selected by the access point. And secondly, it has to, the um, transmission has to get through successfully. So that means that we have to have some decoding threshold which we'll call theta, just a parameter of the model, uh, and the received signal to interference plus noise ratio needs to exceed that decoding threshold. Okay, so two ways to succeed, or you could think about it two ways to fail, but in, in, in any way, both of these things have to happen. Okay, so now a metric for comparing schedulers based on these uh, this context is to uh, look at the number of communication rounds required to reach an epsilon accurate solution. Okay, so now let me say a little bit about that. I don't have a slide on it, but let me say what I mean by ex an epsilon accurate solution. So we're gonna be looking at the pro problem of maximizing um, a, a strongly uh, concave function or minimizing a strongly convex function. Uh, so in that case, um, we know that the primal and dual problems uh, have the same solution. Uh, and when, when, so when we reach, when we, if we solve primal and dual problems and we reach uh, the same solution, we know that we're uh, within, um, we, we have the accurate solution. We, ha we have a perfect solution. Uh, an epsilon accurate solution is one where the primal and dual problems have a solution within epsilon of one another. So if epsilon is small, we're getting, and, and since we have uh, strong convexity or strong concavity, we're getting close to the true solution. So we're going to we're going to set epsilon as another parameter, uh, and we're going to look for how long does it take us. That is, how many rounds of updating do we need to go about uh, to achieve an epsilon accurate solution? So there's two parameters: theta, the decoding threshold, and epsilon, the um, solution, the degree of accuracy of the solution. And within that, and I hope you can see this on your screen, so the, the type is a little small. Uh, it turns out that we can get um, lower bounds on the number of communication rounds required to achieve an epsilon accurate solution for each of the three scheduling policies, random scheduling, round robin, and proportional fare. And they're given here in terms of some parameters. So uh, let me just say what the parameters are again. So out, uh, epsilon is the degree of uh, precision of the solution. Theta which appears down in the denominator uh, as a part of a function, which is just an integral function. Uh, theta is the decoding threshold. Uh, here, alpha is the path loss exponent. Uh, and beta is the precision level that can be achieved at the end user devices. So uh, here, we're just gonna abstract machine learning down to this parameter beta, okay? Uh, so we're not talking about any particular machine learning algorithm. We just say we can get within beta. Uh, uh, precision at the end user devices. And then N, which also appears here, is the total number of exemplars distributed over the end user devices. So it's not very meaningful to look at these uh, formulas, I don't think, 
But uh, if we calculate them for a particular example, I think you can see a little bit about what's going on. So we don't have upper bounds, so we're just going to use these lower bounds as surrogates for, for performance. And this uh, example shows uh, that performance. So here we have um, uh, an example, and this is a co computed uh, computation of those bounds for a particular case. Uh, and we're looking at two cases uh, on the left and the right. So on the left, the decoding threshold is high. And what that means is that the code, the channel is not very good. That is, we have to have a very high SINR in order, to, or you could not think the code is not very good. We have to have a very high SINR to achieve, uh, to, to get the message across. And on the right, we have a low SINR threshold, which means that, that they actually have a very powerful link and we don't need much SINR to get uh, the message across, get messages across. So, and then on the left, in, in red, you have random scheduling, in blue, you have round robin, and in green, you have proportional fare. That's on both of these charts. So you can see that if we have a, a less powerful code, uh, proportional fare is much better than the other two. It has a lower number of communication rounds. And that's intuitively, that makes sense because if you have, if you need a powerful, if you need a good, really good channel to get your message across, then you're gonna choose the channels with the best SNRs, right? Which is what proportional fare does. And that's borne out by this chart on the left. On the other hand, if you have a really powerful code and you don't need a lot of SINR, you might as well just use round robin. And that's what the right hand, the right side shows. In other words, just go through sequentially and let all the, um, choose all the uh, end user devices in, in sequence um, and, you know, you're going to do well and the others are not going to do as well. So basically you're letting everybody report uh, in, in turn. And, and because you, you have a very low decoding threshold, that means that all, basically all of the, those reports are going to get through. So these lower bounds, although they are only lower bounds, they do give us sort of an analytical way of looking at this that agrees with our intuition. We can also do an actual, um, a machine learning problem using these uh, various uh, schedulers. This is uh, basically training a support vector machine on MNIST data, which I'm sure you all know is uh, handwritten character uh, recognition data. Uh, and here we, we've chosen 10,000 sample points and distributed them over 100 de devices. And uh, N here is 20 and K is 100. Uh, and we look just uh, at the, on the left, we look at loss, which is mean squared error here, I think. And on the right, we look at accuracy, which is percent correct. Um, and you can see that uh, indeed, uh, in this case, round robin is better than random scheduling. And I didn't, I didn't put the uh, decoding threshold here, but the decoding threshold here is, is a low decoding threshold. So this, this agrees with what we saw in the lower bounds. Uh, and quite, quite, quite uh, remarkably, actually, you can see the distinction. So, so we see that scheduling does matter. I think that's uh, the, the bottom line here. And so another question might be, can we optimize scheduling in some way? So those three scheduling uh, techniques that I chose or those protocols are just standard ones. So is there something that might be better or optimal for uh, federated learning? So let's, let's address that problem uh, briefly now. So one metric we can apply here is one that might be familiar to a lot of you from uh, other contexts, and that is age of information. So um, age of information, of course, is a widely studied metric now because of Internet of Things applications and uh, applications involving energy harvesting where uh, sensors or other remote devices uh, have to be careful about uh, husbanding their, their energy uh, and therefore uh, have to optimize when they transmit information to a central uh, location. Now here, uh, that's the kind of problem we have, uh, but we're gonna use it to optimize for a different reason, not necessarily for energy savings, but for savings of communication rounds. So, for a give, so here we're gonna define it as following. For a given uh, end user device I, uh, the age of information uh, at a given round is uh, zero if that, device is selected. Uh, otherwise, uh, if the device is not selected, 
that um, age of information increments by one. So we can think about a little counter, T sub I, uh, which counts the age or which increments the age e as long as the device is not selected. And then when the device is selected, the age drops back to zero. So SI of T is an indicator which says it's one if device I is selected at time T for, for uploading and uh, zero otherwise. Okay, so it's a simple little uh, iter iterative uh, process. And then what I'm gonna talk about now is, is actually another paper which appeared just at ICAPS just very, very recently. And I think it's probably still online if people wanna go out and, and see the presentation by Howard Yang, who's at uh, SUTD in Singapore. So we can, given age, we can actually set up a, 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 an optimization problem that minimizes age within some constraints. Uh, I'm not gonna give the details of that here, but it's, it's in that paper if you're interested. Um, but we can look at some numerical results here based on that. So again, uh, I'm looking here at a, a support vector machine uh, trained on MNIST data. Uh, the same, exact same problem I looked at just a minute ago before getting into this part. Uh, and I'm comparing two things here. One is a wireless round robin in blue. And again, on the left is loss. So small is good. On the right is accuracy. So high, large is good. Uh, and then, so that's, that's the wireless round robin is the one that minimizes the average age. And the other one uh, is maximum pack, where we try to choose the uh, pack, the maximum number of um, um, end user devices into the, the spectrum as possible, okay, at a given time. So you can see that compared to maximum pack, uh, wireless round robin is much, much better. Uh, so minimizing average age seems to be a good, good way to go. I'll just point out that this, the age has to be, uh, the average, uh, the selection is uh, on a up, update by update basis. So every iteration, we have to solve the age minimization problem, but it's a problem that has, um, uh, polynomial complexity, so it's not not that hard to do that. Okay. All right. Well, I'm going to shift gears now uh, and, and talk about uh, decentralized learning. And just remember that decentralized learning is the situation where we no longer have the edge device involved, so there's no aggregator. So all we have are end user devices. They collect data. They're doing learning on device. And they may be communicating in a peer-to-peer -peer fashion, but they not they can't necessarily communicate with the whole um, uh, the whole network. And although I show it here, them communicating with the whole network, but not necessarily necessarily they wouldn't be able to do that. Um, and there's no there's no aggregator, so they're just all we can do is communicate peer-to-peer. Uh, -peer. Okay. So to talk about this problem, I want to backtrack a little bit to some work done about a decade ago uh, and talk about a general model for distributed learning, which includes federated learning, decentralized learning, and centralized learning all in the same model. So in this model, we um, have the following bipartite graph model for, for learning. So first of all, one, one layer of this graph is the training database. So, of course, training database means a set of exemplars. We have, what we're trying to do is to learn a function mapping inputs to outputs. Uh, that's a general machine learning paradigm. Um, and the inputs are X's and the outputs are Y's, or the outputs are also called targets, right? So we have a training database, which just is a set of N training examples. So that, that forms one part of the graph. And then we have a set of learning agents uh, which could be sensors or what have you, could even be the cloud device, um, of which there are M, and that forms another layer in the bipartite graph. And then the graph, the edges in the graph um, are connect nodes in the two layers, uh, depending on whether a given learning agent can view the data uh, in, in the, uh, of a given datum in the training base database. So you see here like learning agent one here, uh, L1, which is a triangle with the L1 in it, uh, can see the first, third, and then another um, training data uh, uh, exemplar and, and can learn from those, okay? So this is just a general model for distributed learning. And special cases involve 
centralized learning where you just have one learning agent that can that is connected to every training uh, exemplar uh, or decentralized learning where you have the learning agents actually the, 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 you can think of the training database residing on the learning agents and you have the same number of learning agents as you have data uh, training examples so the data is fully distributed the learning is fully distributed federated learning could also be viewed as, as a like this where the learning agents are the edge devices and the training database corresponds to the end user devices okay so now i'm going to be though talking about decentralized learning where the number of learning agents equals the size of the training database so you have a data point on each learning agent all right so um a natural way to learn in a situation like this is to do local learning so that is, uh, we're trying to fit a function mapping X to Y. And uh, we're gonna do that by le using least squares, some kind of reg a regularized least squares. Uh, and um, the, the learning agents, each learning agent is just gonna perform learning, in this case, kernel learning, but it could be any kind of learning, uh, on its own, on the data to which it has access. Okay, so F1 is gonna use the first, third, and that other um, learning uh, exemplar to learn its version of the function f. F2 is going to do the same, or L2 is going to do the same, all the way out to the last learning agent. Okay, so that's a very natural way to, to learn in such a model, but uh, it has a problem, and that is that it's generally locally incoherent. That is, if you have two learning agents that share a, a, an exemplar, like here I've called out F1. Uh, L1 and LM, they're each going to learn their own version of the function F that maps the X's to the Y's. And when they apply their version of F to X1, they're each going to get a different uh, output that is a different target. Uh, and generally, those targets will disagree because they learn from different data sets. So they're not going to learn exactly the same function F. So this is called incoherence. Um, and it turns out that it's, it's provably uh, non-optimal. That is, you can show that if you have an incoherent um, uh, set of uh, Fs, that there's a better set of Fs that is, that is coherent and is, it has lower overall um, uh, least squares. Okay, so this is not good. It's good from the point of view of uh, communication, but it's not good from the point of view of optimality. So we might ask the question whether there's some way that we can preserve the communication structure of this graph, that is the locality of data, uh, and get away from incoherence. And the answer is yes. Uh, and this comes from an old paper, as I mentioned, it's a decade ago with a former PhD student of uh, Sanj Kulkarni and, and myself, Joel Pred. Uh, and this algorithm works in the following. So let's just look at the case where we have uh, four learning agents and seven um, tr training data. So we might, so let's think about that. Uh, and uh, so what happens is first, the first learning agent is gonna learn from its data. In this case, the first, second, and sixth exemplar. It's gonna get an estimate of the function F from that learning. Uh, and then instead of uh, stopping there, it's gonna write its estimates of the targets back down in the database. So it's gonna overwrite Y1, Y2, and Y6 using its estimates of those targets based on its function it learned. And then we move to L2, which is gonna repeat that process. It's gonna learn from its data. It's gonna overwrite those targets. And then we're gonna move on to L3, same thing, L4, same thing. And then iterate and iterate until convergence. And it turns out that if we do that, that is if we learn and overwrite the targets, uh, that, that process eventually converges to a coherent relaxation of global least squares. So, uh, by relaxation, I mean relaxation to the bi given bipartite graph. Okay, so here we can get that by doing this uh, collaborative technique where we write back in the database. And of course, you can see that we're basic, they're basically sharing information by doing that. So the database is being used is a way of transferring information from one learner to the next, even if they don't have access to the same data. 
Okay, so let's see how that works in an example. So here's a case, a very simple case, where uh, we're gonna have 50 sensors uniformly di distributed between minus one and one in a linear fashion. Uh, and each sensor is gonna observe uh, a function of its location plus uh, white Gaussian noise, IID Gaussian noise. And here, the, we're just gonna, for this example, just to show how this works, we're gonna choose the uh, regression function to be linear. Okay, so F is just a, a linear function of position. Uh, and then we're gonna define the graph by defining neighbors. So two neighbors, so e each, uh, so the, the sensors are gonna be the learning agents and they're gonna be the training, the training data resides at the sensor. So M equals N in that model I showed you. And, and then the graph is connected by defining neighbors. Uh, so to uh, a learning agent it, I is connected to a training datum J if the positions of sensor I and sensor J are within R of each other on the line between minus one and one, okay? So that's how we define neighborhoods. And then the sensors are gonna employ linear kernels. So this is kernel learning, reproducing kernel Hilbert space learning that we're using in this particular uh, example. And so what's shown in this chart is three types of learning. So first of all, this test error is mean squared error here in, in, in determining the function f. Uh, and what's on the uh, horizontal axis is r, the size of the neighborhood. So as r gets bigger, we go from, as r, for small r, we're very highly decentralized. As r gets bigger, we're going closer and closer and closer to a, a fully connected bipartite graph. And uh, the, the solid line, which you can hardly see because it's almost at zero, is the performance of centralized learning. That is, if R was equal to two, so that everything is connected, uh, that would be the performance we would get. Um, now, the dotted line at the top is the performance of local learning. That is, the learning that I told you is incoherent. And you can see that it's not very good. You have to have a pretty big neighborhoods all the way out to 0.6 in this chart before you really hit the performance of centralized learning. So you have pretty big neighborhoods, a lot of connectivity. Uh, and then the dash, the dash dotted line, the one uh, between the two is this uh, algorithm that I just told you, this uh, collaborative algorithm, which we call SN train in this chart. And you can see that uh, it's pretty good, even very low connectivity, but with even 0.2 of R, it's already achieved the performance of centralized learning. So this shows you the power of this uh, technique that I just, just mentioned. It's, it really helps you uh, uh, overcome the, the, the disadvantage of incoherence that you can get from local learning. All right, I wanna, I wanna talk about one more thing and then I'm gonna wrap up. So we've been talking about uh, learning where we're doing function fitting or optimization or, or, or minimization of a function or what, what have you. And now I wanna talk a little bit about reinforcement learning uh, very briefly in a decentralized uh, fashion. So of course, as you, I think you probably all know, reinforcement learning is, is about trying to finding a decision or control strategy um, in, in Markov models, okay, Markov decision processes, when you don't know a model for that process, okay? Uh, and a particular type of reinforcement learning is so-called Q-learning, where you, basically on each iteration, you update a, a Q function uh, and try, that, that, that contains the um, payoff, uh, trying to converge to an optimum. And uh, if you do centralized reinforcement learning, you typically use gradient, uh, descent or gradient ascent to, to uh, find the optimum, okay? Now, in a distributed uh, setting, like we're talking about here, uh, we, can't, we can't do classical gradient dis, uh, updates involving all the data. We can only use local data at each learner. So uh, what can we do? Well, first of all, if we just use uh, distributed gradient descent, we don't necessarily get to an optimum. But if we take uh, classical gradient uh, updates, local gradient updates at each learning agent, and at the same time, we also do another update based on consensus among neighbors, then uh, it turns out that if we have the right kind of connectivity in the network, 
uh, we can get convergence of this kind of dual updating to global uh, Q values, okay? As long as we have connectivity and there are also some tuning parameters in the iteration and so forth that, um, that have to come into play. But, but you, giving those kinds of uh, typical kinds of assumptions, we can get convergence uh, to uh, global optimality. And uh, this is actually shown in this paper shown here. Again, it's not a new paper. It's from 2013 from the Transactions on Signal Processing. It's with Shomo Carr and, and Jose Mora. Uh, Shomo was a postdoc in my group in those days. We did that work. He's now at Carnegie Mellon. Uh, and, um, and so uh, we can sh that's proven in this paper. And I'll just illustrate it briefly here with an example. This is a toy example where uh, it's kind of the simplest possible reinforcement learning problem where we have binary states and binary actions. We assume here we have 40 agents and we build a graph by using two nearest neighbor connectivity. Okay, so that's how we build a graph. Uh, and then on the left, we show how the um, Q value, so there are four Q values here because they're binary states and binary actions. So we look at how do the Q factors converge for centralized versus de distributed or decentralized uh, learning. And you can see that centralized here is dotted, so they converge uh, rather quickly, but uh, the distributed also converges rather quickly to the same values. So. Um, this just illustrates what I told you that what I said that you can prove convergence to centralized values and you see that in this example. This is just for a typical agent out of 40, but you could choose any one of them and of course they'd all show the same kind of behavior. Uh, and then on the right, this just shows uh, how the consensus works. Um, this is, we choose 10 agents um, and we look at their Q factors uh, at, over time and you, and you can see that these are just 10 chosen at random you can see that over time they all converge to consensus. Okay, so that, that affirms this uh, behavior as well. All right, well, that's a very interesting problem. I, I, I'm not gonna talk about it now. We're actually still working on some problems in distributed uh, uh, reinforcement learning and, and hopefully we'll have some more results going forward, but this is just sort of a basic problem that shows uh, how that works. All right, so let me, let me wrap up. I think I'm about out of time anyway. So, um, First of all, the first uh, conclusion, which I think we're all here today to talk about anyway, is that wireless networks can be platforms for machine learning. Um, and uh, I talked about two things. I talked about federated learning, where edge devices, which we can think of as being access points, interact with end user devices, which we could think about as being smartphones, to learn common models, okay? Then I also talked about decentralized learning, where end user devices, which here could be smartphones or sensors, smart sensors of some type, just interact in a peer-to-peer -peer fashion to learn collaboratively uh, or to learn models or to learn actions in the case of uh, reinforcement learning. So I promised to talk about a few issues for research here and let me throw some of these out and, and, and undoubtedly people at this workshop are already working on these and there may be other papers on these, but I'll, I'll just put out put these out there for people to think about. Uh, one is model efficiency. Now, in uh, what I've talked about, uh, particularly the first part, um, really I haven't looked much at the issue of the fact that the end user devices are limited devices. They ju I just abstracted the machine learning uh, in the federated learning model to uh, a very simple abstraction, you know, the precision of learning. Uh, but really, there's a lot going on at the end user devices. There's energy limitations, there's storage limitations, there's computational power. If it's a smartphone, it, what you're doing is competing with all the other functions of the phone and so forth. So there's some fundamental trade-offs here between, for example, the number of layers, the number of neurons per layer, energy expenditure, accuracy, and so forth that could be looked at. And of course, end user devices have often have very simple learning algorithms like, um, you know, all the weights are plus or minus one or things like that. So all these issues could be looked at in this context. And I think there's some interesting work to be done there. Another uh, issue has to do with the communications itself. So uh, we're talking about basically uh, a lot of devices uh, uploading their 
uh, over over uh, wireless uploading their models. So they're sending messages, but those models are correlated. So these are not independent messages, really. They're all learning the same thing. So there's some correlation in the models that are being uploaded. And of course, if we have, if we have correlated sources in a distributed setting, that's a classical problem in, in communications, distributed source coding. Uh, and so it's possible that distributed source coding uh, could help uh, you know, lower the number of rounds we need or allow a greater efficiency or something like that. And this also is something that we're look, looking at tentatively right now. We haven't really got results yet, but uh, one of my postdocs is currently looking at that problem. Uh, another, another issue is that uh, when we're talking about uh, learning at the edge, we're not really talking about big data. We're really talking about sparse data. So it's, it's sort of the opposite of the sort of big, you know, tensor flow kind of problem that people think about in modern machine learning. These are problems where we have small training data. So it's small data, right? These are training sets are small. So that, and of course in wireless uh, settings or in most settings that we're familiar with in wireless networks, we do have models. It's not like these are model free. Uh, so an interesting uh, approach would be to try to incorporate some domain knowledge uh, into the learning at the edge. That would make this both make the models more powerful that we learn and also it would um, uh, play a role in um, lowering the complexity of learning. Okay, so uh, deep unfolding is for example is a technique uh, that's been developed over the past few years for that kind of learning. So I think there's a lot to be done there. We actually have some work going on at Princeton too, but again, very, very early stages, so I don't have anything to report there. And then finally, another very interesting problem, and I talked about this earlier just briefly, is, is that of security and privacy. From security point of view, of course, like every wireless network, there's, there's all kinds of possibility of man in the middle attacks, that sort of thing, malicious end user devices, um, you know, and so forth. So these algorithms need to be made secure against that kind of, of attack. Um, and, and so I think that's um, another area that's ripe for research. And there are things going on, but I think it's still a lot to be done there. And then finally, I'll just mention this privacy. You know, one of the things you hear about federated learning is that it gives you privacy uh, by default. But in fact, it doesn't really, because the machine learning, if, if you, if you do go through um, and, and drive parameters of a model from data, there's correlation between those model parameters and the data. Uh, so, um, you know, so that's, that's really a, a place where privacy can be broached uh, or breached um, in these kind of algorithms. So and, and there's a lot of interesting questions there as the inf they're really information theoretic questions, I think about, how you can, um, uh, how much information can leak through parameters in machine learning and so forth, and how we can mitigate that using uh, various privacy uh, uh, paradigms. So that's, I think, an interesting thing as well. Um, and again, there's, there is work going on in these areas. I think we're gonna see a lot of developments over the, the coming years. Anyway, that's my talk. Uh, I'm done, thank you very much. I don't know if we have time for questions or if we have a way to uh, get questions here, but I'm happy to try to answer any that people may have. Thank you. Yeah, thanks a lot, Vince, for uh, the fantastic presentation. Um, so we may have something like 10 minutes for Q&A. We have one question in the Q&A, um, which says essentially about decentralized reinforcement learning part. Uh, so the question says, uh, what are, uh, who sends essentially the environment updates information to the agents in decentralized reinforcement? Oh, in the decentralized case, it's it's basically peer to peer. So the you know if I'm one of the end user devices, I'm communicating directly with other end user devices in my that, that I that are in that I'm connected to. So my peers, for example, you know in a sensor network. Um, you know, your peers might be uh, those other devices that are within communication range of you. So it would be device to device. Um, I was wondering about this edge of information based scheduling scheme. To me, this seems like a good metric to use since you ensure coverage of all the users and therefore the whole data set. 
but at the same time, it's just one metric, right? I mean, you have no channel awareness. You're not aware of the fading in different channels and such. I was wondering, have you done well, any that, work on combining this? That, that's a very good, good point, actually. I like that a lot. So um, first of all, when we do the minimize the age, we do have constraints. Uh, I, di I didn't put the algorithm, the, the minimization problem up that we do, but we do have constraints for various channel issues, okay? In energy constraints and so forth, rate constraints and what have you. So, so th there are some of that does come into the optimization. Um, but you're right. I mean, we don't, there are, there are uh, known channel conditions and so forth and so on that could be um, brought into play. Uh, but, but again, the algorithm does take it, some of that into account by enforcing rate constraints and so forth. So you wouldn't choose um, devices that have poor channel just because, just, to, 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 just because they have old ages because uh -huh. there's a constraint that makes that, uh, that, that, that would mitigate against that, okay? Unless their age got really, really old, uh, and then that would have maybe overcome poor channel. But, but you're right, I think there's a lot more that can be done there. I mean, this is uh, just a paper, that, a conference paper, and uh, I think, you know, there's, we're doing, you know, we're still working, and, and I think there are others uh, who are interested in this problem, and I, I think it, there's a lot to be done. It's a good point. Is uh, the predator learning is uh, one of the one hop communication between age and sensor devices? How about multi hop communication? Yeah, great question. So uh, that would be another, that'd be very interesting to look at actually. Uh, you know, you have a relay, for example, in there. Um, I think it just gets more complicated, but certainly from a point, practical point of view, that's what you're going to have, especially if uh, some of the devices are at the far edge of, the, of a cell, for example. Um, so yeah, I think that's an interesting question. We, we didn't look at it. In our case, we just, we really abstracted everything down to um, just the SINR uh, for single hop. And you could certainly introduce another level of complexity where you have multi hop or other things of that sort. Um, you know, I think the whole range of, you know, wireless data transmission uh, could be imposed there in some one way or the other. You can look at all kinds of things, right? Um, and I, I just think we looked at the most simple, the simplest possible model just to try to get some idea of comparison of these things. But, but other, uh, sure, sure, other things might work. You could have intermediate um, aggregators, right? That could aggregate a few local devices and then that, those aggregated models could be then sent to the edge device so you have a relay that aggregates at the relay, and then the, the, the relay could forward uh, a few aggregated models to a, a central ag aggregator that could aggregate everything. So you know you could have a so you could have a hierarchical structure. There are, there are a lot of things you could do, and I, I we haven't looked at those, and I would encourage you know people who are interested to explore those because certainly in real networks you do have those kind of uh, opportunities. The next question is uh, about the scalability of decentralized reinforcement learning. So is it uh, scalable to uh, hundreds of nodes? And uh, then the next one is how to deal with the non-stationarity of the environment? Yeah, so it is scalable completely. I mean, it, 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 I guess it depends on, it is completely scalable. Um, I, I think the scalability of the number of nodes is not not such an issue. It's more uh, it, it may take longer to converge because one of the issues you need to worry about is connectivity. Um, and I don't mean fully connectivity, but I mean connectivity in the sense that you can get, that, it, that a piece of information could get through intermediaries from one point, any point in the network to any other point. So if you look at the, at the graph Laplacian, it's, uh, I guess it's second eigenvalue is non-zero. Um, so, um, so that, but so the larger, of course, the larger the network is, the longer it may take for information to diffuse around the network. So I don't, I don't really know the, uh, you know, the, the the constants in that convergence that would would bring that into play. But but certainly, you know, there would be, you know, if you had thousands of nodes, it would take longer to converge. Okay, but the algorithm itself is fine because. Everything happens locally. Com so computationally, it's completely scalable, but it's just going to take longer to converge. Um, I forgot what the other 
other the, the other one was about the non-stationarity of the environments. Yeah, so then, of course, it's a question of, it's, it's a, a race between convergence and convergence speed and, you know, the dynamics of the, the network. So like any adaptive, it's adapt, you know, basically reinforcement learning is adaptive control, right? Mm -hmm. So like, like any adaptive control problem, you know, there's a, 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 a tension between convergence rate of the algorithms and dynamics of the process. And it, the same thing appears here. I mean, I, I don't, and I don't, we haven't really looked at a dynamic environment. So I, I don't really know what that trade off might be and where the, 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 the sticking points might be in that analysis. But I think it's a really interesting question. And again, it, it's a question that comes up in every, every adaptive control setting. You don't really need adaptive control <laughs> if you don't have a dynamic plan, right? So, you know, the, <clears throat> the problem is dynamic. In general and uh, that's why you need to do adaptation and so mm -hmm. there is there is always that tension and I think that's an interesting thing to study in this context mm -hmm. as well. Yeah, I guess that if the optimal solution is like time variant then as you said there is there is this trade-off between how fast we can find that optimal solution and how fast we can find the trajectory of the optimal solution essentially but yeah. that's that's one one question that can apply be applied to any kind of optimization algorithms essentially not really necessarily to this yeah, yeah, and it's an essential question. I mean, I, I I'm not trying to minimize the question. I think it's it's probably the question you know for practical application, mm -hmm. uh, and some of it is just experimental too. You know, you, you you just have a certain kind of time variation and you apply your algorithm to it and see if it tracks. Yeah, um, due to time limitation, maybe we can just ask one more and I can see that there is at least five more questions. So uh, the next question was, uh, how do we take care of non-coherence in decentralized machine learning? I guess that you have answered that. Non-coherent, you mean the lack of coherent? I'm not sure I understand. Yep. Is it lack of coherence in the... Um, in the, in the learning strategies, so that was... Uh, yeah. So I guess that that was the point of, I think I understand the question. I mean, that's kind of the point of, of the collaborative learning. If you, the incoherence comes from the fact that the, you don't modify the data at all as you're learning. And if you go and update the targets um, iteratively, then you, you can get rid of the incoherence, basically. That's sort of the point of that 